proof of Shannon's theorem in the classical case, but also generalized to the classical quantum channels. Uh, and then uh, in the second part of the lecture, yes? Ah, yeah. Uh, okay, so so uh, let's recall what we did yesterday. So remember yesterday we uh, characterized the optimal number of messages I can send over a noisy channel, over a very general noisy channel in terms of uh, hypothesis testing, and namely hypothesis testing be between the, the state which is given by the, the joint state between the input and the output of the channel and the product of the marginals. And so we had this, uh, uh, this converse bound. Uh, okay, and then we had an almost matching achievability bound. Okay. And so what I would like to do now is to uh, consider the setting where, um, the interesting setting where I have n independent copies of a channel. Right, and for that we define the capacity, which you worked with yesterday uh, in the exercise session. And uh, <coughs> so let's see how we can apply this general theorem to the setting where I have an IID channel, okay, and independent copies of a channel. Okay, so I went over it a little bit quickly yesterday. So uh, the idea is this: is yeah, so it's, it's very simple. I just apply it directly to to. Um, w tensor n, and so I get uh, an upper and a lower bound as a function of this hypothesis testing relative entropy uh, plus some uh, small terms here, and then what I do is I multiply by 1 over n, remember I look at the rate of the number of bits I can transmit, okay, and then I take the limits as n goes to infinity and then epsilon goes to zero, and so it gives me this expression, okay, for the capacity. Um, <coughs> so, and uh, the question is, okay, so this expression uh, is not, I mean, we want an expression which is simple to compute, right? We want simple properties of the, um, uh, of the channel. And so, um, uh, so, okay, so let's see. So in, in this corollary, what I stated is I stated an upper bound, a lower bound and an upper bound. Okay, so the, upper the lower bound is simple on the capacity, it looks simple, it's just it doesn't involve any limits, right? And so, um, uh, let's see how this, uh, how this is proven. This, is, this can be proven directly using Stein's lemma. Okay, so uh, we have this lower bound, right? We, we characterize the capacity in terms of this limit, right? The limit of dh, but with a limit as n goes to infinity, uh, but this is exactly, if you look at Stein's lemma, uh, if you fix um, uh, the distribution Px to be product, right? So if you pick Pxn to be a product of Px times Px times Px times Px, then uh, this state becomes a product state, and this becomes exactly Stein's lemma. Okay, and so we can apply directly, and we know that this expression is equal to the quantum relative entropy. Okay. And uh, as you remember, the, the relative entropy between the state and the product of its marginal is nothing but the mutual information. Okay. Uh, so I hope this is clear. So the, uh, uh, I, but in general, we can't say, we can't use Stein's lemma in general to just say that this quantity is equal to the relative entropy because we're not guaranteed that the distribution Pxn is product, right? This is a difficulty. So this state is not necessarily um, uh, of product form, right? And remember for Stein's lemma, it's really, I, I want to distinguish between uh, two product states. Uh, okay, I can nonetheless uh, replace this d epsilon h uh, in terms of, uh, of a quantum relative entropy by using the inequality that we used in the proof of the converse of Stein's lemma. Okay. So, uh, yeah, if you, if you remember, in the proof we used 
uh, this inequality, which relates um, the hypothesis in relative entropy to the quantum relative entropy, and this was proved using the strong subadditivity, or sorry, I should say here, the data processing inequality for the quantum relative entropy. Um, and so, yeah, in this expression, I can replace the, quant the hypothesis test in relative entropy with the quantum relative entropy uh, if I pay this price of uh, dividing my one, one minus epsilon. Okay, and then, okay, so the relative entropy between the state and the product of the marginal is the mutual information, as usual, and, um, yeah, so the only thing I did here is I replaced the, the limit by a supremum over n, and this is just by observing that this quantity, uh, <coughs> f of n, right, which is the supremum over all possible joint probability distributions over n um, copies of the input, of the mutual information between the input and the output. Okay, uh, see that it's uh, super additive, and this you did as an exercise in the exercise session, hopefully. Um, this just simply follows from the fact that when you when you pick p x n to be product, then the mutual information is additive. Okay, but then uh, the the why can it be really super additive and not just additive is if the optimal probability distribution is not product. Okay, good. Okay, so we have this uh, general uh, expression now for the capacity. It's still not uh, satisfactory, right? Because, uh, okay, so this lower bound is nice, but the upper bound has a limit as n goes to infinity, so uh, what is really the use of this, uh, of this quantity, you might wonder. And um, so, uh, here, this is a setting where uh, sometimes, so th this argument that I did here, this kind of always works, right? So it works for any task that you consider, as long as you have a one-shot nice characterization, you can just take the limits in the same way I, I did it. Okay, but what, what uh, uh, the thing that is really nice about this specific task of point-to-point -point channel communication uh, for a classical quantum channel is that uh, there is a, um, there is something very nice which will happen is that actually this will be equal to this. Okay. Okay. So, uh, or in other words, this function, in, in other terms, this function f of n will be actually exactly additive. Okay. And this is the thing which does not always happen, right? So this is really, we'll use very specific properties here of uh, these classical quantum channels. Okay, so this is exactly what I wrote here. So we want to evaluate this expression. And so we'll see here that for classical quantum channels, this reduces to um, just uh, applying this on one copy, which is equivalent again to showing that this uh, Px can be chosen to be product. Okay, excellent. So, um, okay, so let's show this. Okay, this is a simple lemma. Um, uh, but really crucial, I think, which uh, it's, it's the crucial thing which makes Shannon's theorem work in the classical case, is uh, the following, is that, uh, yeah, so if I take for any n, uh, I consider the mutual information between the inputs and the outputs of n copies of the channel, okay? And I optimize over all possible, uh, possibly correlated distributions over the, these different inputs, okay? And so this turns out to be just equal to the supremum or just uh, choosing a distribution over one copy of the mutual information between the input and the output. Okay, so one side is very simple, as usual. So this is the, this side, so the superadditivity. This falls from the superadditivity of Fn. This is the same as the superadditivity of Fn. Uh, so, and you did it in the exercises, so I won't do it. The, the part which is uh, non-trivial is the, is the fact that um, the left-hand side is not bigger. Than the, than the right hand side. Okay, so yes, it's uh, this inequality. So, okay, so we have to start with a, with a distribution on, on the inputs, which is arbitrary, not necessarily product. Okay, and so let's construct rho xn bn as usual, right? So I, I construct, uh, I have the x system and the corresponding output of the channel. So the mutual information between xn and bn is 
Okay, so I'm dropping the rows here everywhere because uh, it's always row. So, um, <coughs> so the mutual information between Xn and Bn is, by definition, the entropy of Bn minus the entropy of Bn conditioned on Xn. Okay, so, um, uh, and now remember my objective is to relate this to the mutual informations uh, of just one single use of the channel. Okay, not, mul not n uses, but I want to decompose this into single uses. Okay, so the natural thing to do for this term is just to say, okay, I have uh, sub-additivity, so the entropy of uh, B1 to Bn is smaller than the entropies of the, uh, the sum of the entropies of the individual systems B. Okay, by the way, I, a notation, I'm not sure I, I fully introduced it, is when I use a notation like this, I just mean x1, x1 to xn, okay? Good. Um, okay, so what is uh, the entropy of, now the conditional entropy, bn conditioned on xn? Okay, so uh, this is also simple to write, because the xn system is classical, okay, and this is important here, is that this can just be seen as an average of the entropies of the conditional states. Okay, so here it's an average over uh, x1, xn, over the values of the system I'm conditioning on, of the entropy, not of the marginal state, but of the conditional state. So conditioning on having x1 to xn, my state on B is this, right? And so uh, I look at the entropy for the system Bn for uh, evaluate it on the state Wx1 uh, tensor Wxn. Yeah, so I recalled here, this is, I use the property of the von Neumann entropy is that conditional entropy is the average of the entropy of the conditional states. This is an easy exercise. Okay, so now what do we use? We will use the fact that uh, the entropy on product states is uh, additive, right? This I think you have seen in uh, one of the exercise sessions that uh, if I take a product state, the entropy is, is additive. Okay, so the entropy of Bn here is just the entropy of B for the state Wx1 plus the entropy of B for the state Wx2, et cetera. Okay, but uh, then of course you see that this term only depends on x1. It doesn't depend on x2 to xn. Okay, so uh, I can just sum for, wh when I look at just this term, I can sum over x2 to xn. And so what I get here is um, for every i, the only term I get is this term, right? Where of course, uh, by definition, pxi of little xi is just the marginal of this joint distribution, Pxn. Okay. And so now what happens, now, uh, uh, yeah, now this is nothing but the entropy of Bi condition on Xi. Right, this part. And so I have the sum for i equals 1 to n of the entropy of bi conditioned on xi, um, which is exactly what I wanted, right? Um, because, okay, so now I get back, let's get back to the, to the mutual information between xn and bn. So I have, the, uh, I have upper bounded by the sum for i equals 1 to n of h of bi. Remember this, we obtain it by just subadditivity of the entropy. And this, uh, we obtained it by, this is, was actually an equality. This, we obtained it by the fact that the channel is a product channel. Right? Um, and the fact that uh, the entropy of the product is okay. And this is again now the mutual information between Xn and, uh, and, and Bi. And so uh, it's just upper bounded by n times the sum over where this, so n times, sorry, the supremum over all possible probability distributions of the mutual information between X and B. Okay, so it's a, it's a simple proof, but uh, um, uh, I, I wanted to go through it to, uh, I mean to, to 
Because, yeah, sometimes I remember when teaching this, people think that it's trivial that this holds, but it's, it's not trivial, and, and oftentimes it, it doesn't hold. Uh, and the, the, the crucial thing is to show that the, the optimal Px is not, is, can be chosen to be product. Uh, good, so if we put all of this together, I can just uh, summarize this uh, um, as uh, Shannon's theorem if you want, for, C for classical quantum channels. And so it just says that for any channel W, the capacity is just given by uh, the supremum over all probability distributions on the, of the input of the mutual information between input and output. Okay, so I should say also that this is actually a convex optimization problem, so you can compute it efficiently. If you have a description of a channel, you can compute this quantity efficiently. Yes? Ah, so because the way I define the channel, uh, I define the capacity is I take epsilon go to zero. Okay, so I, I define the capacity in the optimal rate when the, the, the error goes to zero. Okay, but that's a good point. It turns out actually that you can show that um, uh, this capacity is the right, th is, is um, um, so even if we had taken just epsilon to be a constant, it would give us exactly the same capacity, exactly the same number. Like, exactly like uh, for Stein's lemma, remember? So we only proved the case epsilon going to zero, okay, but it turns out that for any epsilon, you still get also uh, the relative entropy. Here also it's the case, right? Here we have what is called a strong converse in the sense that if I fix any epsilon, imagine I just want the error to be smaller than 0 0.5, okay? Uh, then I, I can also define the same quantity, the capacity, and it, it will give us the same number. Okay. Yeah, so no, the proof I give only works for epsilon going to zero. So you would have to, 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 get, to do a more complicated proof. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, so, so this part of the proof is exactly the same, yes. Uh, uh, this, this additivity is the same. The, the part where we lost is this thing, okay? Uh, from dh epsilon to d, uh, and I, I have this one minus epsilon, okay? Um, but uh, so, oh, and, and also this is the thing that made us lose in the, in the Stein se setting. And, but, uh, yeah, but, so one way to, to handle this in a, in a more efficient way is to use another uh, relative entropy rather than the quantum relative entropy. To use uh, alpha Reni divergences or alpha relative entropies because they're more sensitive in some regimes and so, and then taking alpha going to one, you would get uh, the desired result. But it's a little bit more complicated. Okay, good. Um, okay, so uh, yes, one thing I wanted to, to point out here is, and I think you had a, a, a related question in the exercise session as well, is um, a kind of very nice fact about this is that it's saying that, so of course if you take a channel which where the input is independent of the output, then this is completely useless. This is not only the, the capacity is zero, but you, you can't transmit anything through it. Um, uh, and so this is showing that uh, these are the only channels with zero capacity. Okay, so uh, if you have zero capacity, or so this is obvious that if the channel is trivial, then you have zero capacity, but the converse is also true. If you have zero capacity, then uh, the channel is just a trivial channel. Okay, so as soon as you have some correlation between the input and the output, then the capacity is positive. Okay, and this is, uh, I think, uh, quite surprising and a very nice insight that, uh, that Shannon had. Okay, so I hope uh, this is clear. So what I would like to, to get to maybe a bit quickly, uh, because now the theory is a bit less clean, uh, is for general quantum channels. Okay, so with, with, a, with a classical with a quantum input now. Okay, I still want to communicate classical information between uh, the sender and the receiver, but now the channel is not necessarily having a classical input, right? It has an, uh, a Hilbert space as, as, as input, and I can choose arbitrary quantum states there. 
Okay, so there you can define very similar definitions. You can define an M code uh, in the same way. So the only thing which is different is now my encoding function, instead of uh, mapping a message S to uh, an input of the channel, an X, like a classical X as an input of the channel, uh, now it maps it to a state, right? So to a valid quantum state, which uh, now gets into the, the, the input of the channel. Okay, and then the, for the output is the same thing, it's still a POVM. And uh, yes, what happens here? So again, it's the same, the way to define the error probability is very similar. Um, the only difference is now I apply uh, the channel to E of S, and now E of S is a quantum state. Okay. So, um, okay, so actually if you look back at, at the proofs we did for CQ channels, you see that you can find, uh, you, you can basically readapt these same proofs. Um, by, but just you say that instead of optimizing over the input distribution, which was over the, the, the inputs of the classical inputs of the channel, now you also optimize over these uh, uh, quantum states, sigma a x. Okay, so uh, now x is not really part of the channel, right? So x is just a, a set of states that I choose, okay? Okay, and so the, the set x is an arbitrary set, even of arbitrary size. Okay, and I will optimize over them. Okay, so if I do that and, corresponding the, and, and look at the corresponding CQ channel where on input little x, it outputs Wx, okay, which is the, the Gen 1 quantum channel applied to sigma Ax, uh, then uh, we get the following. Uh, right, so I summarized both the converse and the... Um, uh, and the, the achievability in one statement. Uh, so yes, so here I, uh, instead of just optimizing over the px, I also optimize over these uh, signal states, sigma ax for every x. Okay, and I optimize over now the, over the set x as well. Right, so this becomes a more complicated optimization. And uh, uh, yes, and the converse is also the same. Okay, yeah, so I say I take the supremum over arbitrarily large uh, set, the set X, but uh, yeah, I mean, in, in the final expressions we'll get later, uh, it's possible actually to bound the size of X. Okay, so yeah, as usual, we look at the important special case where I have N independent copies. Okay, and I define the, the capacity in the same way as the limit as epsilon goes to zero, N goes to infinity. Okay. Um, okay, and uh, yeah, I, I can also use the same analysis as before by using Stein's lemma. And so now uh, it's, uh, I will introduce this quantity. Uh, this is called um, uh, the Holevo information of uh, the quantum channel W. Okay, so this is uh, the supremum over all possible not only the probability distributions, but the inputs to the quantum channel of the relative entropy between rho xb and rho x tends to rho b. Okay, so I just say that, yeah, so this is the Holevo information, so I won't discuss it much more, but if you want some uh, more properties, I invite you to look at these uh, textbooks. And uh, also the Holevo information is used quite a lot, not, not necessarily for channels, but just for a family of states, for an ensemble of states. Right, so for a set of probability distributions and correspond and uh, uh, states, and it's just uh, one way to, to define it. It's just the mutual information between the x and the corresponding system A. So I, I, I define the state rho x A, which is just the sum of p of x project on x tensor sigma A x, and I look at the mutual information uh, between x and A. Okay. Um. Yeah, so I wrote here that with this notation, if I have a CQ channel, you can uh, see the, that we, what we showed before is that the capacity 
uh, of a CQ channel is given by the supremum, now only over the probability distribution Px of the Holevo information between uh, the, the, for the ensemble which is given by the probabilities of x and the output of the channel for an input x. Okay, so this is a valid ensemble and so you optimize the Holevo information over the distribution. Okay, good. So, okay, so now let me state what uh, the, the main theorem for, for general uh, quantum channels is for, uh, as far as the capacity is concerned. So, um, yeah, the capacity is just uh, here, uh, we'll just say that it's the limit of, uh, as n goes to infinity, as, uh, of one over n times the Holevo information of the channel tensor n. Okay, so this is the equivalent of the, of the expression we had, of this limit that we had uh, at the, b before having the simplifying lemma, okay, in the, in the CQ case. Okay, so in the, in the, in the fully quantum case, in, in the quantum channel case, then we still have this result and basically it was the same proof as what we did in the CQ channels. You just have to carry around this optimization over the sigma A axis. Um, uh, okay, but as I said before, this expression is not super useful because it's, diff it's difficult to compute. It also involves a limit, okay, as, uh, uh, as the definition of C of W, so you might wonder why is this useful. Um, and indeed, it's not, uh, it's not the most useful expression, and you might wonder whether it also simplifies like in the CQ case. Like, does it also simplify to, I can just take n equals one, and I get, uh, uh, the capacity. Okay, so this was uh, uh, posed, I mean, this was a, a conjecture for some time. Uh, that, that it, it, was th it was thought that it's the case, that it's additive, but um, uh, this was disproved, um, and um, there were constructions of channels showing that, uh, in general, this chi expression is not additive for tensor power channels. Okay, so there exists uh, channels, W, such that if I take two copies of it, it's strictly bigger than two times the Holevo information of just one. Okay, and or in other words, what this is saying is that uh, this ensemble that we optimize over here uh, will not be product, okay, between the different channel uses. Okay, and you can achieve better by doing that. Okay, so yeah, this is what I wrote here, is that uh, yeah, you can choose uh, these ensemble of states so, so that uh, these states will not be of product form. <coughs> yeah, so this was, uh, if you want to, if you're interested in this, uh, the construction, the first construction was done by Hastings in 2009, and uh, it's a quite complicated construction, right? So. The W, it's not a natural W for which this, it's not a natural channel for which this holds. You really have to construct this channel in a very uh, delicate way and um, by using a random construction and, uh, and, and uh, delicate argument. Okay, if you're interested in more about um, uh, like the use of um, uh, geometric analysis in quantum information, I also recommend this. Uh, this book, which also has this argument, is called Alice and Bob Meet Banach. Okay, so okay, so this is the on the negative side. So in the sense that we can't really simplify this expression to just n equals one. Uh, but uh, so the reason this expression is sometimes useful is that for some classes of channels, you can actually show that you have additivity. Okay, so there are some natural class of channels for which this is additive, and so you, we can just assume n equals to one and compute it. Okay, though I should say that this expression, uh, okay, unlike the classical case, even for n equals one, this expression is actually hard to compute uh, in general. Um, I mean, it's, a fi it's, it's then a finite problem, but uh, in terms of the efficiency, in terms of the, of the channel W, this is not, a, not an easy problem. It's NP-hard, actually, in general. Uh, unlike uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the classical case where it's, it was a convex uh, problem. Okay, so I can uh, even give you an example of, of, uh, 
of one, let's say, one frontier in this area is uh, to understand the capacity of the amplitude damping channel. Okay, so this is the definition of the amplitude damping channel, and its classical capacity is unknown. Okay, so it could be additive, or it could be uh, non-additive. This is unknown. This is an interesting question. I mean, from some uh, uh, numeric, I mean, for example, I did some numerical investigation of it, and it seems to be additive, but okay, it's not. A so yeah, this is an interesting uh, question. This is a, let's say, a frontier in this area of classical capacities. Can I ask a question? Yes, sure. Uh, I think this is a very interesting question. I, I, I don't know, yeah. Uh, I don't think, it seems like a very hard question to tackle. I mean, just to show this, like, like to show sure. that for, uh, so like I would be interested. Mm. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. No, no, but this, I agree. I don't care. Yeah, it's, it's finite anyway. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, exactly. So not, not that you know sort of yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I really don't know anything in this direction. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, good. Any other questions related to this? Let me just go to, have to change. Um, Okay, so in, in the remaining time, I'll try to... Okay, so I know that what I advertised was quantum communication, but... Uh, uh, so, yeah, I decided to do something else at the end because in half an hour it would be difficult. Sure, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Ah, um... Um, uh, yes, I think, uh, uh, but it was reduced after Hastings. Um, I think it's of the, uh, if I remember correctly, I think uh, there was an example of the order of 100, like where the dimension was of the order of 100, if I remember correctly. I think by, uh, uh, okay, maybe let me not say name because I, I might make a mistake on, on what the, but I can tell you after. Okay, so now I want to try to, to present uh, sort of uh, another uh, angle to looking at optimal channel coding, um, which I've been interested in in the last few years, which is uh, to look at things, uh, instead of looking at things from a statistical point of view, where I take uh, like n independent copies of the channel and, and look at what can I, what can I relate this to entropic quantities, I look at the question from an algorithmic point of view. Okay, so I assume that uh, the, the, the channel is given as input, okay, and, I, and my question is, I would like to find the optimal codes. Okay. And um, yeah, I would like to analyze this and see if it gives us further insights onto this question. Okay, so, um, Okay, so here, I mean, here I will look only at the classical case, okay? So fully classic, classical input, classical output. Uh, but we'll see still there are some uh, quantum uh, motivations to, to looking at this question. Okay, so what is the computational problem is I have a description of a channel, W, and an integer M, so this is uh, the, the number of messages I would like to transmit. And, okay, so it's, it's more convenient to give it in this way here. And what I want to output is an encoding and a decoding which maximizes the success probability. Okay, so, or I want to just compute what is the optimal success probability. Okay, over all M codes for the channel W. Okay, so, and here I consider really a setting where W is general, okay, completely general arbitrary channel. And my objective is to compute the optimal success probability. Okay, and so actually the, the, the reason I came to this question um, 
uh, my motivation for studying the question in this way was uh, that I wanted to understand how much entanglement between the sender and the receiver can make a difference in terms of, uh, for a classical channel. Okay. Can it, for example, significantly improve my, uh, the, the, uh, my possibility for, for sending information through a classical channel? OK, but we'll see this in a bit. Uh, so let's just define the problem right now. Okay, from uh, I'll write it as an optimization problem. So again, the inputs are W and M. And what, I'll, what, I'll, what I do is I just maximize over all the encoders and the decoders. And I, I took the same notation as what I had um, yesterday. So E is just a function which maps to the channel inputs. So I, I map uh, E of S, uh, see what is the probability that goes to Y, and what is the probability that I decode Y to S. So here the constraint on, uh, on the decoder is just that it should sum to one. Okay, for every y, it should sum to one. Okay, okay so um, it's very simple to rewrite this expression in terms of a more combinatorial problem, where what I want to, to the, the, the objects I'm optimizing over are, sta are sets. Okay, so I can rewrite this expression as a maximum over some subsets of the inputs of the channel. So I look over all subsets of the inputs of the channel, uh, and, and these subsets are, have a size which is bounded by M. Okay. So this is the code. I, I even defined the C, if you remember, uh, in the last lecture. And I want to, so for all these, I want the C which optimizes a function, FW of C, and how, what is the definition of this FW of C? It is um, a simple function, which is just the sum over all channel outputs of, for each channel output, I see what is the input in the code, right, in, in, in the subset, uh, such that uh, the W of Y given X is the largest. Okay, so hope this definition is clear. And uh, okay, let's see uh, very quickly why this is the case. So uh, let's just look at the, the expression. This is the expression for the success probability. Okay, I removed just the one over M. Okay, so I just remember that DS of Y is a probability distribution, right? So I have a convex combination of these terms, right? And so they are, it's upper bounded by the maximum term, right? So um, yeah, I have, yeah, it's just a convex combination is always uh, uh, upper bounded by the maximum. Okay, so I just take the maximum over S and M, I get this, and uh, yeah, so you see that this only depends on uh, the range of E, right? So when I apply E to S's, so I can just forget E of S and just uh, look at the, the, uh, the set C uh, that is defined as the set of X's such that there exists an S that maps to X, oops, sorry. Um, okay, so I, I just get this, and, and so, so the, our success probability will be at most this quantity, but it's uh, easy to observe that you can achieve it by just picking ds of y equal to 1 at the s which maximizes w of y given x. Okay, so you can see that it's easy to achieve this by choosing d of s, ds of y appropriately. Okay, and this is what is called uh, a maximum likelihood decoding, if you would like. Okay, good, so now we have this expression. Now this looks like a very combinatorial problem, right? So I, I, I have a function and I want to, uh, a, f a function on subsets and I want to optimize over all uh, subsets of a given size. Okay, so, so you can make one observation here that this function has a, a, a nice property. Um, in particular, it is, uh, it has a property which is called submodular. Okay, so a function on, on subsets is called submodular if it has this diminishing returns property, right? So if I take two sets, uh, one is included in the other, okay, then, and if I start adding an X to, the to, uh, to, uh, to one of these sets, I can see what do I gain, okay, by including this extra person, okay? So I can look at this for C, so, when I add x to c, I get f uh, of c union x minus uh, f of c. This is what I gain. 
and um, I can look at what happens when I add it to C prime. Okay, so this is the submodularity property is saying that uh, uh, for a smaller set, I gain more by adding x than if my set was already large. Okay, and this function also, uh, okay, if you look at this function, it's also a monotone function, fw. Right, so if I add more elements to, to C, then it's, oh, it, oh, it obviously increases. Okay, and so there is a, there is a very famous result in uh, combinatorial optimization, uh, quite old, <coughs> which says that if you have a monotone submodular non-negative function, then there is a very, very simple algorithm uh, that achieves not the optimal, but close to optimal. Okay, so um, uh, what is a greedy algorithm? So what is the greedy algorithm? It's just that I start with an empty set and I keep adding elements, uh, the ones which uh, maximize my function the most, right? So I can, yeah, so I start with the empty set and I add an element which uh, maximizes uh, the function when I add the element x. Okay, and I keep adding it until I, I have m elements. This is a super simple algorithm, the most simple you could come up with. And then, yeah, so they showed that you can achieve this approximation ratio one minus one over E. Okay, so, and, and you'll do this actually in the, in the exercise session, because I, I feel it's a very nice argument. Um, okay, so what does this tell me on my, uh, on my uh, channel coding problem? Okay, so it tells me that I can actually, uh, with this greedy algorithm, find a code which is maybe not optimal, maybe not the optimal one, but uh, it, will, it will achieve a success probability which is uh, uh, one minus one over E of the optimal. Okay, so if there was a code, for example, that achieves a success probability of 0 0.5, then, um, uh, I will, uh, using this greedy algorithm, I am guaranteed that uh, I will find a code which has a success probability which is at least 0 0.5 times uh, this number, which is roughly 0 0.6. Uh, okay. Good. Okay, so that's a very simple algorithm that achieves this. You might wonder whether you can do better than this. Um, whether we can, for example, find the optimal exactly. I mean, maybe the problem is easy. I can find the, 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 the optimal code efficiently. Uh, so it turns out uh, it's not the case, and uh, it's even not possible to improve this one minus one over e. Uh, right, and because you can do a simple reduction to uh, the maximum coverage problem, and uh, which is uh, uh, hard to approximate to uh, a factor which is better than one minus one over e. Okay, so of course this is assuming p is different from np. <coughs> okay, so kind of the, the question is uh, relatively, is, is settled here in the sense that we understand fully the, the, the complexity of approximating this question the, of the success probability. So let's get back to this, uh, this motivation I mentioned at the beginning uh, about does entanglement help? Okay, and, and this is um, because my objective is to now consider upper bounds. So can I find efficient upper bounds on this success probability? Okay, can I say that, can I run an efficient program which at the end tells me that the best success probability I can hope for is this? Okay, so uh, yeah, again, let's get back to, to uh, uh, the question of how much entanglement helps here. So, okay, so consider this setting, right, where I have exactly the same setting as before, right, so I have this noisy channel, e encoder and decoder, but suppose for some reason uh, the, the sender and the receiver, they share some entangled state. Okay, so this is some pre-shared entanglement state, which of course doesn't depend on the message that, that will be sent. Uh, it's some fixed state uh, of arbitrary dimension and uh, the, both, both the, the sender and the receiver can try to use this, their, their, their part of this entangled state in order to try to improve uh, the success probability. Okay, so let's write down this uh, uh, 
problem of the optimal success probability in mathematical terms. Um, okay, so uh, corresponds to this here. Uh, okay, so yeah, I, I wrote it with a Q here, the optimal success probability that I can achieve with entanglement. Okay, so I said I didn't put any restriction on the uh, Hilbert spaces of the sender and the receiver, so this is an arbitrary Hilbert space H. Okay, and I have a joint state, I can assume it's pure, between uh, the, uh, the two parties. Okay, so Psi is a bipartite state. And I have um, uh, a measurement, a POVM that I perform on the sender side, okay, and a POVM that I perform on the receiver side. Um, okay, so, and, and what is the procedure now? So the, the sender, he wants to, se to, to transmit the message S, okay, so he looks at his part of the entanglement and does a POVM which depends on this S, okay? And the output of this POVM will be an X which you input into the channel, okay? Good, so, yeah, this is exactly modeled by this. For every S, I choose, um, a POVM, uh, and similarly for every Y, I choose a POVM for the receiver side. And so the, the success probability is just given by this, uh, right? So this is the probability of, um, so having S, this is the probability of uh, uh, the POVM outputting X, and then this X goes through the channel, the channel outputs Y, and then uh, I see what is the probability of getting the, sa the same S as here when I decode. Okay, so y of course it's obvious here to see, given this way of writing, that entanglement can only help, right? Having uh, because you can take, for example, H to be one-dimensional, so you'd ha you wouldn't have any um, uh, any state, uh, right? And so this is obvious. But the question is: Is this strict? Okay, so can there be uh, a channel W and an M for which uh, this the the entanglement can strictly help? And uh, the answer is yes, that uh, there can be channels for which this is strict, and this is uh, one of the exercises I put in the, in the sheet. And this actually, if, if you look at it, it's, it's basically the same as if you're familiar with two-player games, right, and uh, Bell inequalities, violating Bell inequalities, and this is exactly, that, or let's say it's, it's a very close setup, okay? So the, the only slight difference here is that um, the, usually in a game, you say either I win or I lose the game, right? Here it's not that I either there is some winning or losing configurations, I just have some coefficient here which depends on the inputs and, and, and outputs which tells me whether I, I, I mean, which gives me a sort of utility for every, win, for every uh, inputs and outputs of the two parties, okay? But uh, it's the same setup. Um, Okay, so yeah, so there, there are games for which uh, this is different, and uh, the question you might, uh, or I was interested in, is, is how much can uh, entanglement increase the success probability? Is it, uh, can we have like arbitrary gaps or um, not? Of course, we know that for general games, we can have arbitrary gaps between the classical and the quantum value, um, uh, and it's even, in this case, uh, like quantum strategies are, are very complicated, uh, in general, uh, but this is a specific kind of setup, right, where we have this channel coding problem where it's, it's not an arbitrary game. Uh, so you can wonder in this case what happens. And so this motivates uh, the, this question of looking at upper bounds on the, on the success probability and more specifically even upper bounds on the quantum success probability. Okay, so we'll introduce a natural upper bound and you'll see it's also an upper bound on the quantum success probability. Okay, from, so from a combinatorial optimization point of view, the natural thing to do here is uh, to look at uh, uh, convex relaxations, and in this case, in particular, linear programming relaxations. Okay, so if you think about it for, for a little bit, uh, you can come up with this, uh, uh, with this relaxation, right, uh, where, um, uh, yeah, so I have still a linear function in W of Y given X, and now, uh, the, I, I replace this, uh, um, this maximum, basically. Remember, I had this maximum over x in the code by this 
uh, by this variable rxy, and I have these conditions on rxy, and uh, I have another variable px. Okay, so yeah, just if you think about it for a moment, this is uh, really the natural uh, linear programming relaxation. Okay, and it's an easy observation to, to, to see that this uh, LP is also a relaxation for the quantum value, right? So for every quantum value, uh, for, for every quantum strategy here, uh, I can construct a feasible solution for this linear program. Okay, so let's see why this is the case. So let's take a, a quantum strategy, right, with a psi e of x given s, d of s given y, etc. cetera. Um, and so whatever, what, whatever the strategy is, I can define rxy in this way. I just take the sum over s of this quantity, and I take px to be uh, the same, except I don't put d of s condition on y. Okay, and it's simple to verify that if you take the sum over x's of rxy's, you get one, okay, by using the normalization conditions. And also it's easy to see that Rxy is at most Px by just using the fact that D is smaller than the identity. And also similarly, the sum over Px is equal to M uh, follows easily by, by the POVM normalization conditions. Okay, so, so we had this uh, quite complicated problem, right, which, where we have to optimize over arbitrary uh, Hilbert spaces. So, uh, and, uh, but, but this is an upper bound which is tractable, right? So this is a linear program which you can, in principle, compute in polynomial time. Okay, in the various, in the channel. Okay, so, yeah, so just a, a remark here is that for those of you who know about non-signaling correlations, so uh, uh, these are a uh, superset uh, of uh, quantum correlations which, uh, where you just put the non-signaling constraints between uh, the sender and the receiver, between the two sides. Okay, and these are linear constraints, and so it happens to be that this LP corresponds exactly to uh, the maximum success probability you can achieve with non-signaling correlations between the sender and the receiver. Okay, and so, of course, from this observation and the fact that the quantum theory with, with measurements is, is non-signaling, um, uh, you have also the, this inequality. Okay. Okay. Good. So yeah. So let's recap now. What what do we know? So remember the the central the, the question of interest was this, right? So what is the optimal success probability uh, for a channel W? And we were also interested in the version with um, uh, qua with um, entanglement. Okay. And so we had a lower bound. Um, uh, on this quantity, which is a construction, it's a specific construction of a code, uh, which is given by this greedy algorithm. And now we have an upper bound also uh, using this LP. So these two uh, extremities here are, are efficient, but in, in the middle here, uh, it's, it's hard to compute in general. And we have seen already from the, from the previous theorem that the ratio, the maximum ratio between these two quantities is one, one minus one over E. Okay, and so what uh, the theorem I wanted to present here is that to say that actually the ratio between this and this is one minus one over E. Okay, so all of these quantities are within one minus one over E of each other. Um, okay, and so you can even refine it a little bit more in the sense that, um, uh, okay, so if you're not happy with this one minus one over E ratio and you want a better ratio, you can get it uh, up to just decreasing the number of messages. Okay, so you can have a trade-off between these things. Uh, so yeah, here, I mean, best is maybe to look at, a, at an example. So yeah, so if I compare just with the, num with the same number of messages, I have m here and m here, then I have this factor one minus one over e, and this actually cannot be improved. Uh, but if you're now willing to lose a little bit in terms of the number of messages, then you can get a factor which is uh, better. Okay, so uh, uh, an immediate consequence of this is that uh, entanglement cannot help by more than this constant factor, right? So, um, uh, yes, so even though there are examples where, where it helps, it cannot help by more than this factor. And even non-signaling cannot help by more than this factor. 
Okay, so again, it was using this, the specific properties of this uh, sort of game, right? Sort of two-player two game. Uh, you can show that for this class of games, the, the, the difference between classical and quantum is at most this. Okay, so another consequence you can get from this result is that now uh, if we look at the IID setting, we, le we let n go to infinity and we... Okay, so you can also define the capacity for a classical channel if you allow entanglement between the sender and the receiver. Okay, this is a valid definition you can give and you might wonder whether this gives you a quantity which is larger or not. Okay. Uh, and it turns out it's, uh, it's not, right, using this result. Um, right, so here, this is why I presented the version with the L and M, uh, because here you need to use a version which is uh, where you get uh, a better ratio. But it's also easy to get using this, uh, this result. It, it's the same capacity, whether you put entanglement or even non-signaling correlations between the sender and the receiver, uh, the capacity will not change. It's still the same formula for the capacity. Okay, good, uh, so, yes, so, okay, so, yeah, so the proof is relatively simple, actually, of this, so let me just very briefly say what, what uh, how it, it goes. So, uh, yeah, so here I'll assume just L is equal to M for simplicity, and so the way, what we have to do is, um, and oh, okay, so actually I, I won't prove that, I won't prove the, the relation between uh, the LP and the greedy, I will prove a relation between the LP and this success probability directly. So I will start from a solution of the linear program and I will construct from it a code, right? So I will construct a code C, so a feasible solution for this original problem I started with. Okay, and so the natural thing to do here is to, uh, I, I pick this code uh, using the, the values of the linear program. Okay, so the natural way here is that if you remember, I had this variable px, which sum to, okay, uh, this shouldn't be k, it should be m. Um, and uh, so px over m defines a probability distribution. Remember, we had that the sum over px is, oops, sorry, the sum over px was equal to m. Right, so if I divide by m, I get the probability distribution. And what I will do is I will just sample from this distribution m times independently. Okay, and then I will have to compute the expectation over this choice of code of this quantity fw of c. Okay, so okay, let me not go over this calculation. It's a relatively simple calculation using basic convexity. And uh, this, uh, uh, yeah, if you compute the, the, this expectation, you show that it's at least 1 minus 1 over e times, you relate this to the value of the LP, right? Uh, because, uh, I mean, you, you, will, you, will, you will use these PXs because they're the probabilities of um, uh, X appearing in the code, and then you relate this to the RXs using the various inequalities, and then uh, here you see that this was exactly the objective function we had. Uh, okay, and so this... Uh, and this concludes the proof of this, uh, of this theorem. Yes? No, actually, no, because actually even the examples are the non-signaling value is one, and you can construct example with non-signaling value is one, and the uh, uh, success probability is one minus one over e. Yeah. Um, Okay, so that uh, finishes the proof, and so, yeah, I can mention here that one uh, question I, I, I thought about uh, but couldn't solve it is the setting where can one generalize this to classical quantum channels, okay, so where the inputs are quantum, where, where the outputs are quantum, because one expects something like this will hold as well. Um, okay, so uh, this finishes the, the lecture, so I hope... Uh, I gave you an overview of some aspects of quantum information theory and some I showed you some of the techniques which are used and I hope these can be useful in your research. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.